doing well today, and I hope that the Lord has already met you. And as we pray every Sunday, and I do want you to know, you are prayed for every Sunday. We pray specifically for the service. We pray specifically for those who are gathered. And I recognize because, one, I'm a human, <laughs> and two, I've been a pastor for <clears throat> a number of decades, that uh, we all come into this place with various things. And so I can't have conversations with everyone, even though I wish I could have conversations with everybody. I know that you are coming to the service um, with probably a mix of things. Some things, if you look in your heart, that you're happy about, you're joyous and grateful for. Uh, in contrast, there I'm sure are things that are heavy on your heart or on your mind. It could be a physical thing that you're dealing with, it could be a relational strain, it could be a financial thing or some, something that's happening. And so we pray that the Lord would meet us, and specifically that the Lord would meet you. And so I'm not sure exactly what that thing is. But I'm asking us, if you haven't done that already, just to, to open your heart and to open your hands and say, Lord, speak to me. Not everything that I'm going to say from this passage will necessarily address what is in your mind. But I trust something will. Be it from this message, be it from a song we've already sung, be it from a conversation that was had around a cup of coffee or in a classroom or afterwards, I don't know. But I know that we as people need Christ. <laughs> we need his Holy Spirit. We need his guidance. And the first point to start is in a posture of humility, right? God, I need you, Lord. I need you. God draws close to the humble or near to the humble. That's a promise, right? Resist the proud, <laughs> but draws close to the, to the humble. And so the right posture for each one of us is a posture of humility and recognition of his great sovereignty and his grace and his goodness and recognition that we are in need of him. And so that's a good posture to take. So this morning we are going to turn to uh, John chapter 18. So if you do have a Bible, go ahead and open to it. Uh, there are Bibles right in front of you. If you're looking for a printed hard copy, it's there. The verses, of course, are going to be up on the screen. And we've been traveling, by the way, if you're new with us this morning, we've been traveling through the book of John for about 43 plus weeks now. We've been looking at what is written, and primarily focusing in on the goal of John the Apostle, who was directed by the Holy Spirit. He wrote in John chapter 20, verse 31, the purpose of writing this book, this account, this gospel, these words of God to us, so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing in him, we, you, I, may receive life in his name. So John's primary objective is to reveal Christ. And so he starts out wondrously and he continues on revealing various aspects of who this man Jesus truly is by his various miracles, by his continually fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, by his wisdom and his teaching, by his compassion, by his goodness, by his power, and by his sacrifice. The last few chapters, John the Apostle slows down and records with detail the last words of Christ to his disciples. We read marvelous things there and, of course, hear this incredible prayer as Christ prayed for himself, Christ prayed for those gathered in that space, and Christ prayed for us. And then as we turn from chapter 17 over to chapter 18, we see now Judas, we see now the betrayal, and we see now Jesus stepping forward as Dionysia wonderfully displayed for us and set this up. 
Now, before I jump into the passage, I'm going to tell a story. This is a true story about a self-sacrificing hero named Maximilian Kolbe, who was a Franciscan friar during World War II. Now, Kolbe was imprisoned in the Auschwitz concentration camp for his activities in aiding Jewish refugees and the Polish underground resistance. So in July 1941, a prisoner escaped from the camp, which prompted the Nazis to select 10 men at random to starve to death as a punishment and a deterrent to the rest of those in prison. Now, one of the chosen men, Franciszek Gajonicek, a Polish army sergeant and father, he pleaded for mercy, explaining to the guards that he had a wife and children. Now, at that moment, Maximilian Kolbe, he stepped forward and volunteered to take the condemned man's place. So Colby's offer was accepted, and he joined the other nine men in a starvation cell. Now, despite the harsh conditions and the impending threat of death, Colby maintained a spirit of hope, <laughs> encouraging his fellow prisoners through prayer and hymns. After two weeks of starvation, I'm sure they were already quite anemic and tired. Colby was the last one left alive in the cell. To ex expedite his execution, the Nazis injected him with a lethal dose of carbolic acid on August 14th, 1941. Now, Maximilian Colby's selfless act of sacrifice his, uh, his sacrificing his own life for a stranger exemplifies the true spirit of heroism. His actions go beyond the call of duty and showcased the power of compassion and courage, even in the face of extreme adversity. Heroes step forward and sacrifice themselves for the benefit of others. And we honor them, we esteem them, and we revere them for it. Now in contrast, villains sacrifice others <laughs> to benefit themselves. And we disdain and despise them for it. Jesus is a hero. And he's more than a hero. He's a savior. But he's more than a savior. He is the Savior, the only person qualified to take the place of another. Now, the another is not some fictional character that was there with Jesus. The other is you. It's me. It's us. And in the story of, 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 of Colby that we just read... These men were indeed victims, right? But in our story, in our case, we are indeed guilty. Guilty of trespass. Guilty of rebellion. <laughs> guilty of sin against a good, and holy, and loving, and righteous creator. Scripture says that all have fallen short. They've sinned. 
If you examine your life, you'll see the truth of that statement. (laughs) Who among us have not lied? Who among us have not placed God first, but placed ourselves first? Who among us have not broken the commands of God? And into our dire situation, up stands and steps forward Jesus to take our, your, my place. For the punishment of the guilt of our crime. Hero. So John records this passage, what indeed took place. And I'm going to read it in its entirety. We're going to circle back and look at a few things that are evident in this passage so that we indeed can see the characteristics of the one called Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the Son of God. My heart is that you would esteem him greater after we go through this. You would love him fuller. You surrender your life to follow him fully. And if you've not seen him as your savior, that you would indeed believe today. This is John 18. I'm going to read verses 1 to 12. When Christ had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. Now on the other side was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. Now, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, stepped forward and asked them, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am. Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I'm he. If you're looking for me, then let these men Go. Now this happened so the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I've not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup of the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. Now, in reading this, if you're familiar with the New Testament, you might have said, um, why did John record Jesus praying in the garden, right? This famous passage that we recognize, especially on Good Friday, where he was alone praying, and the the prayer was so agonizing that his sweat was like or turned to blood. This was not recorded. John intentionally put that aside because he was highlighting something else. Also in this account, John did not record That Jesus was kissed or betrayed by Judas with a kiss. A good friend of his, by the way. Someone who he had spent 
the last at least three years with. And the others didn't know it was Judas that was going to betray him because Jesus treated Judas with the same love that he did with all the others. That wasn't recorded here either. What else wasn't recorded? Not only did our dear friend Peter, the fisherman who was probably good with a fishing pole, but not so good with a sword, right? More than likely hitting the helmet, sliding off and slicing the ear. By the way, it'd be very hard to slice an ear off. What's not recorded here is that Jesus actually healed that ear. John doesn't record that. So if you know this about some of the other accounts in the other Gospels, you have to ask yourself, well, why is it that those details weren't recorded here, whereas John records other details about this that the others do not? I want you to think about what John's purpose here is, to reveal who this was. And we know from earlier that he is the healer. We know from earlier that he had relationship with Jesus. We know earlier that he was a praying man, but he wanted to focus in on this Savior stepping forward in all his, well, no, veiled in his humanity for a brief flash. They saw his power. He wanted to show us Christ who was in control, Christ who was willing, Christ who had resolve to step forward. The first thing I want to point our attention to is this characteristic of Christ, this determination or resolve. This is the resolve of Jesus. I want you to think about this, right? I'm going to read it just quickly again, and we're going to take a look. So here it is. When he had finished praying, praying, Jesus left with his disciples, crossed the Kidron Valley. Why did he do that? Right? Well, Jesus, and by the way, it, it, he says here that he knew all that was going to happen to him. He made sure that we recognize that Jesus was no fool. Jesus was not, well, maybe it won't happen that way. Jesus indeed knew what was going to happen. So in light of this understanding, then Jesus, who was in the city with his disciples, surrounded by a million plus people who were just days before singing his praises, thinking that he was indeed this king that was going to set all things right, he left that situation, crossed a valley with a river to go to a different place. Intentionally, why? Well, if this detachment of soldiers along with the Pharisees, these religious leaders, had come to him in the middle of the city, people would have noticed this. People would have wondered what had gone on. And more than likely, there would have been a commotion and people would have rallied to his side. And half a million against 200, or 2,000 against 200, or how many we have gathered, would have been a problem. So Jesus intentionally left the city to a place that was on the outskirts, setting up what was going to happen. So he left there. And he didn't go to some place that Judas wouldn't find him, right? Jesus had every opportunity to run away, right? He knew that Jesus had, uh, Judas had gone out, right? He knew what was going to happen, and he could have said, well, I'm out of here, right? He could have, right? He could have ran away. He could have gathered people around him. He could have made this cry to this crowd, and they would have responded to him, but he did not do any of these things because he knew this was not 
his mission. He came to save his people from their sin. And so he went away and he went to a place that he knew Judas would check, right? Because Judas was looking for him. And so Jesus intentionally went to a solitary place, a place that he knew Judas, Judas would check so that he would be found with his disciples in a lonely or solitary place. So Judas came to the garden with all of these people, grown men, right? This was not a group of preschoolers, right? These were men who had been trained to push back uprising, been trained to defend themselves, who have been trained to detain and kill. Lanterns so they can see torches that no one would get away. And weapons. Because they anticipated that there might be some trouble. And John, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, put in verse 4, Jesus, comma, knowing all that was going to happen to him, stepped forward. Now, what was it indeed that Jesus was thinking about that was going to happen to him? Jesus, as a rabbi, as a good Jewish man, knew Scripture, of course, being the Word becoming flesh, knew these things. He knew that his hands were going to be pierced, Isaiah 53. He knew that punches would come, and spitting and a beard pulling from Isaiah 50. Jesus anticipated the lashings and the beating that would be beyond human recognition. He knew of the oppression, Isaiah 52, and he rightly feared the crushing of the Father, Isaiah 53. He knew he would have no rest, Psalm 22. He heard the dogs approaching, Psalm 22, the stampede of bulls surrounding him. Again, Psalm 22. He knew the lions were coming to devour. The beasts of men would soon wag their heads at his anguish. He knew his very soul would be poured out to death. He knew his dear disciples would soon desert him. And most terrifying of all, he knew the Father would forsake him. Knowing all of these things, he Stepped forward from the line of fire into the crucible to save those he loved. He did not run away. He did not hide. He did not defend himself. He stepped forward. It's remarkable. This is a hero. And Jesus, by the way, because it is hardwired in our DNA, is the archetype and the substance of every story we love. From Gandalf the Grey, from Lord of the Rings, gave his life and said, fly, you fool. 
from Frodo, from Lord of the Rings, who sacrificed himself for others. From even Lily Potter, right? Sacrificing his life, her life to save her son, Harry. Right? And he sacrificed himself time and time again to William Wallace, from Braveheart, who laid down his life to Maximus. Gladiator to Katniss Everdeen, right? <laughs> I've seen it, I've read it. I volunteer as tribute to save her sister. To Aslan the Lion, right? In the Chronicles of Narnia. walked into and laid down on the stone table. We continue this story because it's, this it's the story of Jesus. Right? One stepping forward to save others. And here is Jesus knowing indeed what he was going to suffer stepped forward. And he did it not because he was defenseless. He did it not because he had no other choice. He did it because he chose to do it. Because he loved. Now, John then gives us another detail revealing not just the resolve of Jesus, which we see, but the power of Jesus. This is like remarkable. And maybe when you read this, you haven't noticed this detail. And it is a stunning detail. Verse 5 of John 18, after Jesus said, hey, hey, who are you looking for? Right? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I am he, Jesus said. Judas was there, right, verifying indeed this was the guy. There was no trickery happening. Now, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground, right? Now, could you imagine this? Like, what was going on here, right? Again, these were strong men, trained soldiers, ready for battle. And when Jesus asked, who do you want? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, by the way, I am. Ego of me, this is the Greek. If you look, if you are a Greek person, and some of you are, that's literally what is recorded in the Greek. Now, the he, okay, <laughs> is some translators, and the majority of them translated that, but there's like seven or eight that said, mm, we shouldn't put he in there because it diminishes the impact of the statement. They're trying to say, well, it sounds better, I am he. But in reality, based upon what John was conveying and what the Greek actually said, Jesus stood forward and said, I am. And the power of that moment and that state, I think there was just a flash, like in the burning bush, like in the transfiguration. For just for a moment, they saw what was right underneath the surface, who this was. He said, I am. And just a drop of the weight of glory was enough to send them to their knees. Now, I don't know how you get up after that. <laughs> Maybe the second statement was like, who do you want? Um, Jesus of Nazareth, sir. 
that might be it. We don't get tone. Do you mind coming with us? I don't know how you get up after that. No, they must not have known what happened. I don't know what happened. But I can go back in, in heaven and say, hey, can I see the tape of that, right? <laughs> Maybe. I, could, I don't know how it's going to work. Maybe. I don't know. Why this? Because there is display of his majesty momentarily, instantaneously, based upon a statement that God himself proclaimed. He claimed that same title for himself, and it was enough to send them back to their knees. This was no um, weakling. This was no um, anemic little... 100 pound, six foot Dave Spooner junior high boy. <laughs> this was God. <clears throat> the one whose voice created everything. One who speaks and things come into being. The one who speaks and water storms go still. The one who speaks to the dead and they hear him and come back to life. This is that voice. Jesus was not lacking for power, but chose humility, chose meekness, chose sacrifice. As he stepped forward and we came behind him. This is remarkable. This is Jesus. This is a hero. This is the Savior. Stepping forward. Take me. And he said, I'm here. I'm the one you want. Hey, see these guys here? Let them go. As an initial sign of the greater work he was doing, that in Christ we all can go free. Let them go. And he was fulfilling a promise that he declared to these men earlier on. Saying, you will not be harmed which helps us. Not only did Jesus fulfill his promises to those who were immediately with him, Jesus fulfilled his promise to you. When he says he'll never leave you and forsake you, he meant it and means it, and it's true. When he says I'm going to prepare a place for you, he means it, and it's true. When he says, I'm coming back again, and I'm going to make all things new, he means it. Jesus has always fulfilled his promises, and he always will. You can count on it. Let that encourage you. Right? And get an understanding of Jesus stepping into this situation, not as a victim, but as a volunteer. Take me so they can go free. I want you to feel the weight of this love for you. Don't you ever think that you're unloved or unlovable? It's a lie. Christ loves you as you are. He doesn't say, mm, you better improve a little bit, then I'm going to like you a little bit more. He never said that. He did this before you even acknowledged him. <laughs> Where you were deep running away from him and actually resisting him. You, 
you cannot be more loved by God than you are. Regardless of your behavior. Now, when we surrender, we follow him and he transforms us into his image because it's best for us. But we don't become like, like Christ so that we can be loved by Christ. We're loved by Christ, so therefore we become like him. Do you understand that? Right? There's a difference. Right? So John, by the power of the Holy Spirit, says, hey, hey, hey. I want you to understand this about Christ. He was determined to do this fully knowing what was going to take place. Not being duped, not with the hope that eh, it wouldn't be that bad. He knew it was going to be horrific. And yet he steps up. And he steps up, still maintaining his full power, steps forward. I'm the man you're looking for. Thirdly and lastly, the willingness of Jesus. This could be love. It could be a lot of different words. I just chose willingness. Right. John 18, 10. Right. And we see Simon. Right. Simon's going to come back into play in a significant way. Right. We're going to see him as we just continue to read just through this chapter. We'll see him. We'll see him... <laughs> Through the um, crucifixion, the resurrection, and the restoration. Here he is at this time willing to physically fight. Jesus said, Peter, this is not what's going on here. Your macho, your muscles, your physical strength. This is not what this is about, Peter. Put your sword away. This must take place. Peter, understand what I'm doing here. But here's Peter with the sword reaching out, and Christ responds in verse 11, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Peter, this is why I'm here, and this is the cup of the wrath of God. Shall I not drink it, Peter? What I'm doing is for your benefit, Peter. Stop. This is what you need the most. You need me to do this. Thank you for your Defense of me, but that's not what's happening here. Jesus chose to drink this cup to display the goodness of the Father. Do you remember that when Jesus prayed in 17 verses 1 through 5? Father, glorify me so that I can glorify you, God. Show in me your goodness so that you will be praised, so they understand who you are. We can understand to a fuller degree the heart of God, your creator, your savior, your judge, the justice of the world. His heart is redemption, connected to justice, there is grace. And the real hero steps forward. God, show your goodness in this, the extent of your love in me for them, so they will know you, and so that we can be in glory together and they can experience all of our goodness. This is a big deal. So Jesus stepped forward on his own accord, willingly, to lay down his life. No one would stop him from doing so. Even those who wanted to fight to stop him from doing so. 
Remember what Jesus says? I am the good shepherd. Do you remember that? The good shepherd does what? Lay down his life. For his own benefit? Surely not. Granted, there was joy for him in what was the reunion and what was to be accomplished by him stepping forward, but it was bad, horrific. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. No one takes it from me, Jesus said, but I lay it down on my own accord. Jesus was not forced into it, but chose it because of the goodness and the love of God. Jesus, just previously in John 15, said, Greater love has no one than this. Then he laid down his life for his friends. You, friends of Jesus, are precious to him. May he be precious to you. Like a fellow prisoner, so to speak, stepping forward to take your place. Honor him. Give him praise. Love him. Esteem him. Praise him. Bow down to him, not as a mere man, but as God Almighty, the great I am. This child in the manger is also the hero on the cross and also the great king who is coming back again in all his glory. Jesus, Christ, the Son of God, who takes away the sin of the world, the lion who became the lamb, the hero who stepped forward in your place. Worship him. Honor him. Revere him. Cling to him more than anything or anyone else. He will never leave you nor forsake you, and he keeps his promise. So I don't know in this what has spoken. Hopefully something has to you. This is a love you can trust. <laughs> this is one whom is worthy of your life, of following him, and knowing him, and being in him, and letting go everything else to gain him. He is the true hero of all heroes. He is the savior of all those who believe in him. Know him, follow him, sing his praises, honor him, for he is worthy. He is worthy. So I'm going to pray for us now. So, Father, um, what an honor it is to gather around what is written for us. What an honor it is to speak to your friends who are gathered in this place, those that you love. Jesus, as I know, as you know, um, we want to see you clearer and know you fuller and be rooted in you deeper so that you can be seen in us and we would know you. Not just intellectually know things about you, but know you experientially.
said, you walk with us. And you've given us your spirit as deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And you work in us to transform us into the image of your son. You tell us to have this mind in us like you had, Jesus, that we too would walk as he did, giving our lives. And Christ, often I fall short of that. Help me. Help us. And help us internalize this great love of this great hero. We anticipate meeting you. And now we believe, based on the testimony of these men who wrote these things to us, this firm foundation of the prophets and the apostles, we believe and help us to continue to believe. God, I pray for one or more who are here that mm, this doesn't know. God, I ask that you would reveal who this one name, Jesus, truly is. God, help us who have committed yet. God, that we would grow in our treasuring of you, Christ. That we'd be happy to forsake and indeed at times suffer for the one who suffered for us. Help us to know the glory that is yet to come. Hang on to that glorious hope. You indeed are the king and will make all things right and true and good in the end. We believe that story. And thank you for your great invitation to it. We give you praise, our great king. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.